similar to the way Kai and presented yesterday. And we don't necessarily just use AIS. So we're going to talk a little bit and give a different perspective on our risk assessment and welcome Joao, who has also developed uh, criteria in a, a matrix for doing that. We'll be talking about, as Todd mentioned, health, safety, and security issues, and how to conduct a, a boarding and inspection. And then there's been a lot of questions over BMS and other electronics. So today we'll be basically focusing on the pre-arrival activities and what we'll be starting the discussions to be continued tomorrow what do you do on the vessels? Best practices for conducting. ACMA did a great job. Brendan, I don't know why I keep calling you ACMA, sorry. Brendan did a great job on Monday, kind of highlighting the agreement and walking through it and, and that Annex B. And we're going to kind of go into the documents a little bit more. And what is it you should be looking for when we're talking about these things? So our focus will be a bit more on the operational aspects of the implementation, whereas um, similar to Thailand's and giving that overview. How do you best streamline your enforcement resources? Todd talked about uh, many of us here today have large EEZs. Indonesia gave the example yesterday of designated four of their ports and controlling where foreign flag vessel activity goes. Philippines highlighted that they have two designated ports. Okay? So, by, deter by basically telling vessels where they can go, you can streamline your enforcement resources when, when they're limited. So that's what it means by closing ports, sorry, FAO for the language error on here, ports of non-compliance instead of convenience, ports of non-compliance, two IU fishers, making sure they have limited places to go. Okay. So that's what we're talking about, these cost-effective ways when we talk about the Port State Measures Agreement. The Port State Measures Agreement does not give any new authorities to inspectors. Okay. So at the operational pieces, the, the authority to inspect, the authority to go all over the vessel, the authorities to collect evidence, seize evidence, all of these things come from your national laws allowing them for the purpose of inspections, and that's a critical piece that we will get into. Uh, denial of port services, conducting inspections, and taking enforcement activities. And this is one of the strengths of the agreement because it's also targeting things like the carrier vessels or transshipment vessels or reefers, depending which language you speak. Okay, It's targeting the vessels, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, right? How do these carrier vessels, how do these processing plants, the transshipment vessels stay at sea? They have to be getting fuel from somewhere. They have to be getting food, crew, provisions. So those all follow under this fishing-related activity category. So it's not just the fishing vessels itself. There is an exemption for artisanal vessels, and I know we all define those differently within our laws, as well as container ships. And this word gets a little bit clunky with translations. So just to make sure we're clear, we're not talking about these guys. Unless there is evidence to suspect one of these containers has non-previously landed product on board. Okay. We're talking about, when we talk about carrier and transshipment vessels, we're talking about these vessels. Oh, we have a pointer. That's helpful. I didn't know that. So there is an exemption for container ships. Okay, so a lot of times when we're doing trainings, we have a whole discussion on what do these words mean. So hopefully the pictures help for the different languages in the room. I think we've covered this. So we're talking about non-previously landed products, fisheries products, and then again, including this very important definition of fishing-related activities, all strengths of the agreement, not just the fishing vessels themselves. So here's where we're going to get into the key obligations. Um, Brendan gave a great overview on his presentation on Monday, but we're going to dig a little bit deeper on what does this mean from an operational perspective and give multiple examples on how implementation can occur. Okay? Again, 
It comes down to what is best for your institutional and legal frameworks. So this is a list of all of the key obligations that the agreement focuses on specifically. And I wish there was a more fun way to talk about treaties, but you're going to have to. So just help me persevere as we get into the details. We're going to go through these one by one. Article 7 is the designation of ports. So what this means for us is we're going to talk a little bit more instead of the agreement text on how we've implemented and how we've seen other countries. I kind of touched on this. Right now, Indonesia has about four, uh, four vessels proposed for designation. Philippines has Jensen and Davao. And many of the other country presentations we heard from yesterday highlighted this, whether or not you do or don't have designated ports. That's okay. I know we have both non-parties and party countries in this room. So I, I understand not everybody here is a party to the port state measures agreement. However, the PSMA can be a very strong resource for what the global standard, the global minimum standards are for conducting best fisheries law enforcement practices. Okay? So you don't necessarily have to be party to this agreement to start implementing these pieces. If you, uh, there are a lot of calls for training, okay? The agreement has a whole annex on guidelines for training of inspectors as a starting place. So using the agreement as a resource and tool to help strengthen all of our capacities is a key thing. For the United States, we're in a little bit of a different situation for port designations. All of our ports, basically we allowed all of our ports to be designated PSMA ports because there's catches, there's reasons for this. We already have domestic law in place that says non-previously landed fish products can only be landed in our territories, okay? So American Samoa, Guam, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, with some exceptions for treaties. We also have rules for how we do the AREP screening that we're getting notice of arrivals in many cases 96 hours in advance. So with that long of a window, we felt pretty confident that if an IUU vessel was coming to American Samoa, we would be able to send one of our agents or inspectors to go inspect that vessel. So we would have that coverage. Now we greatly empathize and know that that's not possible everywhere. This was just what we could do in our current environment, okay? But many applause for the, for the countries in this room that have designated their ports of where foreign flag vessel activity can go. Sorry, I couldn't pop this on or off. <clears throat> I think just an important caveat here. Part of the reason, um, one, not previously landed fish from foreign flag vessels oh, sorry. can only be landed in our territories because of some other requirements. but. The other thing is, because we can deal with fishery support vessels, um, they could go into any port in the United States. We have, and Captain will touch on this, but our prior notice of arrival is 96 hours. So realistically, where my enforcement personnel are staffed in the United States, I can get to virtually any of our ports within that 96 hour window, which allowed us to expand our ports and where we could go. So it seems like a, like a lot, but we don't have foreign flag vessels coming into all of our designated ports. Just because they're designated doesn't mean that vessels are entering there. So what we've done here, and I apologize because I'm, I'm seeing some squints that it might be a little bit too small. Uh, we provided some slides for you, and this is more resources to take back home. One of the most popular requests that we receive for technical assistance is standard operating procedure development. And we've heard it come up a couple times in this room already. And so what we've highlighted here for each of the key operational obligations of the, of the agreement, we've tried to just highlight questions that would help you 
and those that are still in, uh, working out implementation and might be non-parties, are the things to think about and consider. So in terms of port designation, I understand most of us in this room wouldn't be the ones making these decisions, but it's, it's questions of um, which ports are designated, okay, which ports are being designated, and most importantly, what we see in legal frameworks is making it a prohibition or making it illegal for foreign flag vessels or fishing support vessels to enter non-designated ports, if that is not already in your laws. So not only is it the port designation piece, it's making sure the enforcement folks in this room can take law enforcement action against vessels that go into a different port. So that's the operational piece for you. Making sure you or your managers have worked within your government processes to ensure you have the correct legal authorities that you need. Um, and then the public publicization of information would probably not be an operational. So pre-arrival activities. So we all talked about the ARAP. We should all be well versed in what this is now. Um, like Todd said, we, we, we call it a little bit different in the United States for the notice of arrival. So if I say that, I mean the ARAP as a heads up. But essentially it's used to initiate assessments on whether to allow or deny vessel entry. You're gonna hear a lot from us today that from the United States perspective, Unless we do not have law enforcement personnel in a port, which because of that 96 hours we think would be a really rare situation, our position is that we don't want to deny a vessel port entry. And this is because we want, as inspectors, and I know many of you I see shaking your heads already, as law enforcement and inspectors, we want to get on that vessel. We want to collect evidence. We want to see what's there. Okay, so for us, from our perspective, we don't want to just deny it. However, it is a very strong deterrent. Uh, and we're going to talk about the process of how this works and the way we have implemented. So, you guys saw this yesterday with the ARAP from Thailand, so I'm not going to go through all the blocks. But if you don't have a prior notice of arrival already within your countries, and um, you're not collecting this type of information. Annex A in the agreement is a good resource. Okay? It's the minimum standards of what has to be required. We saw in Thailand's presentation that they also require four different categories of vessels to submit a whole other slew of documents. Okay? That's fine. You can require more information. Absolutely. This is just the minimum for the agreement. And yeah. So for considerations, I kind of, oh, I got ahead of myself, but it's recommended for states. We've heard a lot of different time frames jumped out at us of how long do vessels have to do a notice of arrival um, in, in the various countries here. Um, for us, this was already part of our United States Coast Guard regulations. So for us, they are what are, is called our captain of the port. They are the agency and authority that are controlling what vessels can come in, in and out of our ports, okay? In many of your institutional frameworks, it could be a port authority. It could be a harbor master. It could be your Navy or your Coast Guard, okay? Oftentimes, it's not actually the fisheries entities that have control over this. So it's very important from our perspective to work within your current frameworks. Don't try to build new systems that may already exist. And we've, in fact, been in uh, interagency or interministry workshops where the customs department might raise their hand and be like, oh, yeah, we have that. And then the fisheries is like, oh, we'll work with you to create this. So instead of making new things and making it more complicated, we took the approach that the Coast Guard already had regulations in place. They have the authority, so we worked with them. As both Todd and I have mentioned, for us, it's a 96 hours advance notice of arrival, and with exceptions, depending on voyage for our border nations. Okay, so there's always exceptions to the rule, right? 
I was a scientist. My, my words to my students is always, you can't say the word always or never, because there's always an exception to those claims. So for us, it's 96 hours with some exceptions. Um, we've heard many good things, 48 hours, 72 hours for Thailand. I know, in, I know the Philippines and the new draft executive order have increased their timeline from 24 to 72. Yep. So making sure, we're going to talk about why this time period, and, and Brendan and Joao and Thailand have mentioned this, but the screening that needs to be done of that AREP notification and getting your staff, this is what all plays into that timeline. It's not just for the vessel. So everybody likes flowcharts, i found. It kind of simplifies the, the agreement and the bite-sized pieces. And we will be sharing all these presentations with you. This is just an example of kind of the, how the workflow for the US happens. So for us, the US Coast Guard already had what's called our ship arrival notification system. So that is where vessels are basically submitting a version of the AREP, their advanced notice of arrival. So instead of building a new system, we said, hey, Coast Guard, can we have access to this? And through our interagency process, we were able to work that out. So NOAA now has access to the Coast Guard ship arrival notice notification system so we can see what vessels are coming in and out. Okay. So if your fisheries divisions in your country don't have access, perhaps, maybe it's an MOU, hopefully it could be something a little less formal, but understand the policies vary from country to country. Some type of agreement, if an existing system already works, exists. Yeah? So just, just to clarify that a little bit, um, and talk about your implementing legislation. So, well, the Coast Guard and NOAA work very well together. It helps incredibly. Our implementing legislation literally tells us from Congress that you will use the U.S. Coast Guard system. Coast Guard, you will provide that information to NOAA. NOAA, you will make a decision on entry or non-entry. So it kind of clarifies the interagency process. So I just throw that out. Each of your countries may work differently, but to Joao's point, um, it's a state responsibility. Congress effectively worked out any interagency question as far as how we were going to work together because they dictated in the law who was responsible for what and how it was going to be utilized. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's in our legal framework. So Coast Guard system receives the notification from the foreign, foreign flag fishing or fishing support vessel. We have access to the system, and NOAA, our analyst team that Todd mentioned earlier, get the notification, and some of our others. But we receive the PSMA relevant no notifications from the Coast Guard automatically. We develop filters in their system. They receive over 200,000 vessel notifications a year. So that's very labor intensive and includes things like tankers and vessels that would not be subject to port state measures. So we've created filters within the system to pull out the fishing and fishing support vessels. And then at our headquarters office, our analyst team have one of their primary responsibilities is reviewing all the notice of arrivals for the United States. Now, understanding there are many countries in this room right now that get far more foreign flag fishing and fishing support vessels than we do. Um, we, we get a little bit more than Australia did, that Brendan mentioned his 20. Uh, we're seeing more than that, but we are certainly not receiving the volume of vessels that some of your countries are. Because of our legislation that dictates where non-previously landed foreign fish by foreign flag vessels can go. And I got ahead of myself. So this is just highlighting our process out that we receive advanced notice of arrivals or the AREP from the Coast Guard system. And our first step is our system is an electronic submission. So we're getting these notifications. The vessels are submitting, or the vessel agents, similar to Thailand, are submitting these electronically. Okay. I understand not everybody has this capacity. Some are still either radio alerts, some are still um, radio calls, those types of things. 
So ours is an electronic process. So we were, that's how we were able to develop these filters. We have a consolidated all of the known IUU vessels from the RFMO vessel list, and that is our first, basically, screen of names. So those automatically get red flags. Now, there are some vessels that are false positives. We have a fairy named the Maria, and on one of the RFMO lists somewhere, there is a Maria. So we see Maria coming up a lot. But as you implement, you get, Tyler mentioned this yesterday, you get very familiar. For us, we're getting the same vessels over and over, so we get quite familiar with what we're seeing. And it's those anomalies that trick us up. So we first screen all of our arriving vessels against the known RFMO list that we'll talk about in a little bit. And then we have filters to get the fisheries related. A lot of people in this room have already covered possible intel sources. Step one for us is, is the, RFM, uh, sorry, is the vessel an RFMO blacklisted vessel? That's step one for us. From there, similar to Australia, similar to Thailand, similar to the others we've heard from in your, in your member country presentations, we use other sources of intelligence. So we have a case database system where our inspection reports are available nationally to all of our fisheries officers. So if a foreign flag vessel is boarded in Alaska, sorry if you're not that familiar with the United States geography, but it's on the west coast, very cold there, in Alaska, um, and then enters another port, the fisheries officers all over the United States could query and search for that vessel if needed. Okay. We have a vessel going into uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, and then goes into Miami, Florida. That information is known. Okay. So one is case database. So working within your existing systems to figure out how a fisheries inspector from one port knows that that vessel has been boarded and that vessel goes to a different port. We've seen this in the absence of electronic systems. Um, we cannot endorse this in any way, but we've seen other countries implement this as simple as setting up a WhatsApp group for the inspectors, for them to be able to communicate. Hey, have you gotten this vessel before? Hi, I think something's weird about this vessel. Have you, has this vessel come to your port? On the AREP, I saw it just left your port. Okay, so there's a lot of different ways to be able to do this to share your national information outside of an electronic system. Um, and then, Australia did a great job. Intelligence. Another country, large, the large two coastal states, the RPOA, IUU, any of those notification processes that Todd will talk on a little bit later. So again, these are just questions. We're not going to go through these one by one, but for those that are still implementing or to get to India's point earlier about how do you get all the coordination at the governance level in Joao's response? Having those inter-ministry meetings. Um, I know Indonesia presented on that they had the PSMA Secretariat that they're developing between, I think there are 11 ministries? It's a lot of ministries. <laughs> um, the Philippines was talking about their one step action centers. Okay, so having that interagency coordination, and then importantly, what Todd mentioned, the legal responsibilities and roles laid out. So these are just questions that walk you through that standard operating procedure. Okay, so a couple to highlight. Who receives the advance notice arrival? Is that your port authority? Is it your harbor master? Is it your coast guard? Who's going to screen? How is that? AREP, but it then be sent to the fisheries offices to be screened for IU fishing activity. Okay? And then as we walk through the different operational obligations, how is that information then going to be shared with the inspector before he or she boards that vessel so that they have as much information prior to the boarding? So these are the types of questions, instead of saying which office or which agency or ministry is responsible, we literally want to know who. 
Okay, is that the Office of Law Enforcement? Is that Pesca Cafe? Is that Capture Fisheries? Who is doing these and each? So we've now we had a foreign flag vessel. It's seeking entry, in this case, to a U.S. report. Okay, we've received that ARAP. The information's been communicated to all authorities. So in our implementation, that's Coast Guard to NOAA. And now we're going to screen it. We're going to talk about the screening process a little bit more. Just real quick, I mean, we're going into a lot of detail from a lot of information at you. Yeah. I think what we want to do is, through this process, help you look at all the different angles. But remember that the agreement itself the core obligation of all that are parties and all that become parties to the agreement is that we don't allow a known IUU fishing vessel to use our ports. So at the true base level, we talk about how we're really going to use it to combat IUU and we want to use these as best practices, but at the very core level, your obligations as a party is that you must screen foreign flag fishing vessels entering your ports and ensure that no known IUU fishing vessels or fishing support vessels utilize your ports. So just please keep that in mind as we're walking through all these other best practices. That's your core obligation. And I say that for those that are not parties yet, often some of the thing that makes part makes countries decide they're not sure about becoming parties is the concern that they can't meet the obligation. And while there's several other obligations, the core is right there. Just don't let screen and make sure IU vessels can't use your ports. Before we start talking about going into further detail about screening vessels, are there any questions at this point about how to collect the AREP, what the requirements are? Are there any questions? Okay. So we hit on this. So when you're screening vessels, it's not just the IUU vessels we're looking for. And Todd in a little while is going to talk about some of the limitations of what the ARF lists are. It's not just is it a blacklisted vessel, it's also is it an authorized vessel. Okay? Can they be fishing or transshipping? Okay? So in the discussions, Thailand, we want to applaud your efforts on your great tabletop exercise yesterday. That was fantastic on the AREP analysis. Um, thank you very much for that. On the very first page of the donor vessel packets, it was a WCPFC authorization. So some of the documents we're going to be talking about, you guys saw yesterday. Okay? However, there seemed to be a little bit of confusion on how RFMO authorizations worked. The, the Southern Blue Tuna Commission? No, no, okay. So, Indian Ocean Tuna Commission? Western Central Pacific? Yeah, I know you, yeah. <laughs> you guys are in effect, that sure. Okay, so between those two, okay, it is not the actual regional fisheries management organization that gives the <laughs> authorization or permit to the vessels, okay? And I heard a lot of conversations about this yesterday at the tables on side discussion, so I wanted to hit it. For a vessel to fish on the high seas, that authorization comes from the flag state. So at least at the table I was at yesterday, there was, I think there were two United States vessels, fishing vessels in, in Group two's example, yep. It had a permit from the United States. If you, did every table have a, have a high seas permit document? Did each of the three groups have a high seas permit in their examples? Okay, so there was a high seas permit. I'm using the United States because it's what I know. It was our national permit for that vessel to fish on the high seas. That permit is what authorizes the vessel to fish under WCPFC. So I just wanted to clarify that 
when you're going to the authorized record of vessels to see if that fish, to see if that fish, to see if that vessel can fish or transship, ultimately that permit comes from the flag state. Okay? And I heard a lot of discussion yesterday, so I wanted to clarify that a little bit. So, kind of step one is easy. Go to these lists. They're available online. If you're not familiar or have never seen one of these websites, I'm happy to maybe do a demonstration of how you find this information. Also in your briefing folders that we gave you, if I can take a peek at yours, we gave you a table that says example sources of verifying and validating vessel and ownership information. In no way does the United States endorse one of these over the other. These are just examples when we get into Todd's presentation on sources of information um, with the web links where you can go in order to hopefully help you, show you where you can go to find information. And the RFMO lists are on this sheet. Okay? Thank you. So, is the vessel authorized to do what it's doing on the high seas? Is it a blacklisted vessel? Those are kind of the very first steps to screening for a port state measures agreement. Oh, and I gave, these are the websites for each of the individual regional fisheries management organizations. From there, there's the record of, record of authorized vessels, there's the IUU vessel list, and it varies from RFMO to RFMO. If a vessel is authorized to fish or participate in fishing related activities in more than one RFMO, you have to do checks of both. Um, this is going to be actually pretty applicable for Southeast Asia for countries that are receiving vessels that have fish in the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, and or the Southern Ocean. Okay? So some of your countries, I know, are receiving vessels from multiple, that have had activities in more than one regional fisheries management organization. So similar to what Thailand showed yesterday, you've got to check all the information. So I wanted just to give an example, okay? Each of the lists online are different, and there is not consistency of what information you can get. So there might be more information on a vessel and another RFMO if it does have authorizations in more than one. So I'm going to give an example of that specifically. Here's an old, this is not current, I did not look it up this year, but a previously could be current. Sample and vessel for the Fu Yon Yu that was authorized to fish in the Inter-America Tropical Tuna Commission. So that's on the east side of the Pacific, okay? So this is the information that this regional fisheries management organization gives you. Next slide. The same vessel also authorized to fish in the Western Pacific. This RFMO gives you a lot more information and even a picture, okay? So this is just showing you that there's a variety, there's possibly a variety of resources to be able to find information and different information, okay? For the Regional Fisheries, uh, the regional fisheries Management Organizations, it's the responsibility of the flag state to keep the data current, okay? Joao on earlier this week also mentioned FAO's global record of fishing vessels. And that is something that's still being populated, but what it does provide is registry information for the countries that have uploaded their data. So perhaps you have a question on one of your coastal states, is this registered within their national Okay, so is it a, I'm gonna pick a country, a Cambodian, because you're right in front of me, flag vessel, is the registry valid? Because a lot of times these documents are in other languages and it's hard to know if it's real or not, right? And so 
that's at least helping us populate the database for fishing vessels so you can be like, does it have a Cambodian? Now, I don't know if Cambodian flags are up there, but we're starting to get in a world where more and more information is becoming online with these voluntary systems. So at least you can go as a first check, see if that vessel's listed, and if not, what would you do if the vessel wasn't listed as a registered vessel? What would be your next step? Who would you contact to verify the registry of a vessel? Oh, Thailand taught you this yesterday. I was there. Who do you, the flag say? There we go. Are we still awake? Is it lunchtime? Have I lost you? Oh, I got some thumbs down. Uh-oh, I'm trying to make it more exciting. You can contact the flag state, okay? Exactly. So this is just showing you the different resources. Next slide. Uh, so check the R from all this. Names and registration numbers change. We all know this. We all know that that's a, one of the most difficult pieces of combating IU fishing is when the vessel changes its name, they, they fake their IMO numbers and they change their flag states. Yes. Just in case that uh, we have, uh, we determine already that the vessel is in uh, IUU. Mm -hmm. So as an authority, uh, they are already in our jurisdiction. So do we have uh, the power or authority to apprehend those IUU pieces or just? Uh, so I'm not. And enforcement officer, so I go to the enforcement officer. So that's going to depend on your national law. So, and that, that sometimes I think is the misnomer that everybody says, oh, it's an IUU vessel, so we can all go out and arrest it. No. That, again, Port State Measures didn't give us any new authority. It gave, us, it gave us different obligations to exercise effectively our existing authority. But it doesn't set, suddenly give you a right to go out and arrest a vessel because it's an IU vessel if there's no violation of Philippine law, for example. Now, I will advocate this and take this opportunity because I'll say this many times, is I would certainly encourage you to take the opportunity to board that vessel, inspect it, and gather any evidence or information you can that would either A, give you information that finds a violation of Philippine law so you could take action, or gather information to provide back to the flag state and the relevant RFMO that continues to build this investigation toward apprehending or forcing action by the flag state on this vessel. So, I don't know if you, yes, thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks, Todd. Um, I'll just give a quick example. Um, so, the recent vessel, the Panama flag Nika, it was believed to be an IU vessel. It's not actually right now on any IU list, but it was transiting through um, Indonesian waters. Now, Indonesia took the opportunity to board that vessel, and Indonesia is now taking action against that vessel because it didn't have its fishing gear stowed at the time. So therefore, they were actually able to take action against it under their own powers. So underneath, under Indonesian legislation, they have the ability to do that. As Todd said, it all comes down to what your legislation allows you to do. And that's why it's so important to know your powers as an officer. Okay. And then FAO, um, and I would direct any questions to Joao on this one, but FAO also has a vessel search database. And this is really to help streamline inspectors until you get familiar with all of these different lists and where to go and which link do I follow. So in this case, this vessel, and it's just an example, is, I'm sorry, I can't see. It's flagged to fish in um, the eastern side of the Pacific Ocean, the western side of the Pacific Ocean, and, and one other place. So it's letting you know, hey, this vessel is or is not authorized to fish in these different, so it's basically comparing the list. It's not always current though. So the thing that you're gonna hear from the most, us the most, is trust but verify. So always verify the information. Thailand did a great job of showing that in the 
how they do that for each step. If there's a gap in it, AIS, they go to the engine room just if they claim there's a, a, a mechanical issue. If there is weather, you check the weather. So always trust, but verify. Um, I'm going to skip this slide because Todd's going to go over this in, a, in a, quite a bit more detail. But basically, these are just other areas that hadn't quite been discussed in the course of the week yet. Uh, we talked about the enforcement database. I understand that all countries have these electronic case monitoring systems. So again, it's about working within your current environment. It can be as simple as a WhatsApp group and inspectors that we've seen incredibly successful. Um, the RFMOs, we talked about fishery observer records. I'll, Todd will get into a little bit more, so it's your logbook spring. We'll talk about this when we talk about boarding inspections. Cross-checking the information, and we will get into information analysis. That needs to occur with the screening process of the vessel, similar to what you would do on board the vessel. Okay, when you're going into the bridge and comparing all the documents. So there's information analysis pieces prior to the vessel's arrival, while you're conducting your inspection, and then after you get off, when you have to verify certain pieces. And again, the slides that look like this are all just questions to ask internally or within your governments to help guide standard operating procedure development. Um, that's the biggest question we get. How do you do this? By answering these questions, it hopefully helps get you there. So these are just things to probe, decision points to think about. So who examines the a who receives the ARAP? Who examines it? How is that ARAP screened? Who has to get that information? Those types of questions. Especially when you have multiple ministries or agencies involved in your implementation to help streamline these communication plans. 